book of the Song of Solomon, chapter number 6. The Bible says in verse number 1, Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? My beloved is gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Our, our, our hearts were, were certainly blessed and our souls stirred by the good singing. Lord, we thank you for the good testimonies. Lord, not one person brought attention to themselves. Everybody bragged on you, and they praised you, and they exalted you for how good you've been to them. Lord, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And it's always a blessing to hear your people testify about what great things you have done in their lives. Now, Father, I pray for those folks that uh, were requested uh, to be prayed for. I pray for uh, Debbie that has cancer in her lungs and on her brain. God, you know all about it. And I pray you'd help her through her testing, give the doctors the wisdom they need. And God, I pray you'd do a work in their lives. I pray for Brandon. I pray you'd touch him and his sugar. I pray for Miss Sunny and her back. You'd strengthen her and help her. I pray for little Jackson. You know what he is facing, that young man. Over the last few years, we prayed for him much. He's had cancer and a lot of health problems. And God, I pray for him. I pray your will would be done. God, the other request, you'd move upon them. Now I pray you'd bless the reading of the Word of God. May it uh, truly be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. May the Word of God enlighten us, may it instruct us, and may it lead us in paths of righteousness. God, I pray for those who are working with the children on the other side. You'd bless their efforts, help those uh, 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 children uh, they receive the Word of God with gladness. Lord, uh, may those that have not reached the age of accountability, may it lodge deep in their hearts that, Lord, when they reach that age, they trust Christ at a young age. Uh, those that have been saved, I pray they'd grow in the Lord. Uh, those that, Lord, haven't been saved yet, I pray that, Lord, the Word of God would convict them. We'd see them born again. I pray for those working with our teens. You'd bless our, our teenagers, Lord, and all they're faced with in this wicked world, all the peer pressure and all the problems, uh, all the avenues the devil has to uh, uh, t steal their attention away from the truths of God. I pray that now you'd insulate our young people and help them. And, Lord, I pray you'd get glory from this service uh, and I pray you'd help us tonight, send revival, save the lost, uh, and glorify your namesake. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I never like to look to the Song of Solomon without uh, making the, uh, this announcement about it. Uh, there are a lot of preachers that preach it, and they want to spiritualize this book. There are a lot of them that just want to use typology out of this book, but the Song of the Solomon is an actual, literal love story uh, between Solomon and a young maid. Uh, that is very important to understand that. And the Song of Solomon is a difficult book uh, 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 to grasp because uh, 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 one moment the bridegroom's talking, the next moment the bride's talking, the uh, next moment uh, 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 some of her contemporaries are talking, so you've got to pay real close attention who is speaking and who they're speaking to uh, to get a grasp on the Song of Solomon. Now, in verses, I want you to notice a few things. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is what is asked. Uh, what is asked? Uh, look again at verse number 1. The Bible says, uh, Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Uh, now, uh, this is asked by uh, some of the daughters of Jerusalem to the little maid. Uh, the little maid has went on record uh, uh, talking about uh, Solomon. Uh, in chapter number 5, she refers to him many times uh, as her beloved. Uh, uh, she calls him in verse 10 of chapter number 5, the chiefest of 10,000 uh, to uh, her soul. Uh, uh, if you look in chapter 16, she says, His mouth is most sweet. Uh, yea, he is altogether lovely. Uh, this is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, she's bragging on his beauty. She's bragging on his countenance. Uh, she's bragging on his ability. She's bragging on his intellect. Uh, and the daughters of Jerusalem do not believe uh, 
that she has won his heart. Hmm? Isn't it amazing when you start telling folks about Jesus, they don't believe that you are what you say you are? Hmm? So they're asking her, where is your beloved? You've been bragging about him. Where's he at? Now notice, if you will, that they're antagonizing her. Look again at verse number 1. Where is thy beloved God, O thou fairest among women? They're making fun of her. Where is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? They're antagonizing her. They're mocking her. They're saying, oh, we want to seek him with you. Just show us where he's at. And they're making fun of her. And can I say, it's a cruel thing, but if you name Jesus as your Savior and you start letting people know, there are some people that will mock you because of your faith. Hmm? But then I want you to notice the answer. Look what she has to say. In verse number 2, she says, My beloved is gone down into his garden to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, to gather lilies. And then she makes a little exclamation point on her answer. She said, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. What an answer. So I'll tell you where he's at, but just in case you don't know, I'm his, and he's mine. Hmm? What an answer, huh? And people will say, well, if Jesus is real, why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he do that? Well, he's sitting on the throne just keeping the earth on its axis, uh, hearing and answering prayers, blessing people, saving people. He's doing what he does, but just in case you don't know it, I'm his and he's mine. Hmm? What an answer. What an answer. Now, I want you to notice some, some types. I love types. I used to preach a lot on typology. You know, everything in the Bible has a literal meaning, but there are some things that have uh, spiritual meanings. There are some things that have types. They're a type of something. It's a picture of something. It represents something. Now, there's some types here that I'm interested in. I want you to notice in verse number 2, she says, My beloved is gone down into his garden. The garden here is a picture of the church. A picture of the church. Now, imagine what she's saying. They say, where, where is Jesus? And she's saying, well, he's down at the church house. You know, we know the Lord's everywhere. But he did say where two or three were gathered in his name, he'd be in the midst. Uh, he does meet at his church. And thank the Lord for the church. Now, of course, we know she's talking about Solomon, but when Jesus walked among men, he said one fairer than Solomon is here. Hmm? Uh, Solomon's a picture of the Lord Jesus. And uh, where is he? Where's he at? Well, he's went down into his garden. Hmm? Isn't it a blessing to be able to come to church and don't have to worry about wondering if the Lord's going to show up? Hmm? And the garden's a picture of the church. I want you to notice it. Uh, she also says, to the beds of spices. Now, what does that represent? Spices. What do they represent? What are they a picture of? Well, they're a picture of hot spots. Now, can I say something? There are churches that use the right Bible, that have the right doctrine, that do everything right. They cross every T right. They dot every I right. They got the right kind of singing. They got the right kind of Christian fellowship. They got the song books. They got it all just right, but they're dead in a hammer. But she says he's gone down to the spice. He's gone down to the hot spots. There are some places they just got the fire of the Lord in them. Are you listening? There's just the touch of God on them. There's just uh, something about them. You go in and folks are on fire for God. Folks want something from God. They're, they're not only doing it right, they got a touch on it. Uh, hey, uh, as he said, uh, he's gone down into the gardens to the beds of spices. Uh, there's just some places where he not only shows up, he shows out. Uh, there's just some places you just know he's amongst you. Uh, we see the spices. They're hot spots. The garden's a picture of the church. But notice, if you will, something else she says. She concludes verse number 2 and says, To gather lilies. Lilies are a picture, in this sense, of believers. Did not Jesus come seeking to save that which was lost? Does not he say to Jerusalem, uh, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have not gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks? Uh, 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 what does the Lord uh, seek to do? He seeks to gather uh, lilies uh, 
into his fold. Uh, he seeks to gather those that will believe on him uh, and make them part of his own. So with that in mind, notice what it says in verse number 2. My beloved's gone down to his, to his garden, to church, to the beds of spice, to a hot spot, to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. It says that he's there to feed in the gardens. Now look at verse number 3. I'm my beloved, my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Verse number 2 says he feeds, uh, or to feed in the gardens. In verse 3, he feedeth among the lilies. That word feed means to provide something necessary for growth. So when he comes to feed in the garden, he is coming to give you something that will cause you to grow. My dear friends, when you come to the house of God, you ought to be seeking something from the Lord uh, that will cause your faith to grow, uh, to cause you to grow as a Christian, as a believer, uh, uh, to cause you to grow closer to God and to get more from God. To feed means to grow, to give you something that will provide growth. But that word feedeth in verse number 3 means to gratify. Now, uh, can I say, it's one thing to eat something nutritious that will cause you to grow. Mm, it's one thing to eat broccoli and Brussels sprouts and, and uh, cauliflower and kale and spinach and you know, all that stuff's good for you don't always taste good unless you got something on it to doctor it up you know what I'm saying uh, so you know a half a pound of butter mm. Miss Annette's got this thing she's been doing on vegetables I mean we eat vegetables we like vegetables but she's got this thing she does where she, she puts some season on them and bakes them we got that from Jeff Ruby's, by the way. We ordered some vegetables. I mean, you remember you always went. We ordered them vegetables, and they went, mm. So she started doing that. Man, we beat our brains out with our tongue getting to them vegetables to eat them like that. But there's some vegetables that they help you grow. They're nutritious. You get my age, they start putting stuff in a blender, and it's green, and they say, drink this. This will help you. It's nutritious. It'll help you all right. Help to the grave quicker is the way I look at it. There are some things that will cause you to grow, but there are other things that gratify. You know, I can deal with, the, with the, the vegetables, and I can deal with all that stuff that's good for me if I can get to the sweets. I always base my restaurant experience on the sweets. Whether or not I want to go back is usually determined uh, on what comes after the main course. Are you listening uh, 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 they're called sweet for a reason. Hmm? Now, fortunately, I'm on medication now that helps me deal with the sweets. And I eat them like I've always eaten them, but my sugar don't go up. And I say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You know what I'm saying? But there's something about gratification. Hey, it's one thing when you come and you learn something. One thing when you come and God deals with you and He breaks you for your growth and to make you better. Uh, but isn't it better uh, uh, when you come uh, and it's just sweet uh, and it's wonderful uh, and it causes your soul to rejoice uh, and causes you uh, uh, to say, Hallelujah, I went to church tonight. Uh, with that on mind, in mind, I want to preach on this little thought for just a few minutes. I'm going to preach on feasting with Jesus. Huh? says he feeds in the garden, and he feedeth uh, among the lilies. Well, if you're saved, you're one of his lilies. Huh? And isn't it good when he comes and feedeth amongst us, huh? and gratifies us? Huh? Huh? He always shows up to feed us. But there's something about when he feeds amongst us. Uh, it's just gratifying when we leave the house of God and just say the Lord showed up. It's a blessing. Uh, I got to thinking about just feasting with Jesus. Can I say when you feast with Jesus, it's satisfying company. There ain't anybody else I'd rather eat with than him. There's just something about when you open the bread of life uh, and you begin to look into it uh, 
and then he shows up uh, and he feeds with you. Uh, uh, there's just something about when the Word of God uh, uh, gets bigger than that. Uh, when the Word of God becomes more personal. Uh, when the Word of God gives you a promise. Uh, when the Word of God just gives you hope and strength and encouragement. Uh, when you're lower than the lowest and you get in the book uh, and he shows up. Uh, and he becomes that friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Uh, when he becomes that present help in time of need. Uh, there's just something about uh, it's satisfying company when he's feasting with you huh I've read many books but there's just something about his book when you get to reading it and he just kind of shows up and reads along with you huh when he shows up and says here look consider this uh, 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 I was reading this psalm. Matter of fact, I was reading it last Sunday, or this uh, chapter last Sunday night uh, uh, before church. I was reading this, and I got there uh, when it said, He feedeth among the lilies. Uh, uh, you said, What happened? He just said, Look at that for a minute. Uh, and I, I've been looking at it for a week, uh, and there's just something about when He breaks bread with you. Uh, it's satisfying company. Now, hey, I've been, to, I've been to dinner with folks, and I couldn't wait for it to get over. I mean, it wasn't very satisfying being with some folks. I don't even order dessert. I said, check. Let's go. It's been painful enough. Uh, I won't call any names. I was with somebody not long ago. Told Miss Annette on the phone. I said, well, that was two hours of my life. I'll never get back. Uh, but it's never that way with Jesus. Uh, as a matter of fact, you don't want it to end. When he's around, are you listening? Isn't it wonderful when we've been in some of them services, you look up and you can't believe what time it is? You think, we've been here that long? Feels like it's been about 15 minutes. What's the difference, him? Hmm? When you're feasting with him, it's satisfying company. Can I say this? When you're feasting with Jesus, it grants stimulating conversation. Hmm? There's some people I've been around them, they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and never say a thing. Hmm? Huh? Uh, kids Google this by the crowd in here anybody under 40 y'all remember them Stein uh, uh, Steinberg commercials yeah and, and then <laughs> Bill shopped there uh, remember them commercials of the Steinberg salesmen come out and start talking about a washing machine and it's just blah, 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 blah. And he's all excited, but even his family didn't want to hear about the latest washing machine. There's just some people, the conversation just isn't real good. You know, true conversation is give and take. Both parties have some interjection. And true conversation is you hear what the other person says, and you not only hear it, you're able to, you know, listen to it and decipher it and understand it, and you're able to communicate it back to them, and, and you have some stimulating conversation. But there are some people you just don't like to converse with. Have you ever gotten in a prayer closet? Have you been reading the Word of God? And all of a sudden, He shows up in your prayer closet with you. It is stimulating conversation. You're talking to him, then he gets to talking to you through the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, whatever was bothering you when you entered the prayer closet isn't bothering you anymore. Hmm? It's some stimulating. Sometimes he just reminds you that he loves you. Sometimes he reminds you what he done for you. Sometimes he just reminds you that this is not our home. We're just a passing through. It is stimulating conversation when you feast with Jesus. What a blessing. Hmm? I thought about this. When you're feasting with Jesus, it provides stirring consequences. When you're uh, feasting with him and feasting on his word or sitting under preaching or in your prayer causes and you and him start doing business, it will stir you up to do something. Hmm? I never got stirred up to do anything for God watching a ball game. I never got stirred up to do anything for God watching Hallmark. God bless Hallmark. But I've been in church and sitting under some preaching or hearing some good godly singing and something gets a stir in me and caused me to want to do something for God. See, it has stirring consequences. 
See, you can't help but be around Jesus and it not stir you up. Matter of fact, you've got to be careful because sometimes we get so stirred up, we're like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. We say, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And then we open our mouth and say something stupid. You know? He wanted to build a temple for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. But Jesus didn't come to have a temple built for him. He came to build the church. Hmm? Sometimes we get stirred up and say, I've seen people in, in camp meetings stand up and say, God called me to do something. Sit down. God didn't call you to do nothing. You just stirred up. And the truth be known, and the truth proves out whether or not God called anybody to do anything. And just watch their life in the weeks to follow. Where God guides, he provides. I was in a camp meeting one time, and this young man, he, he came to me after an evening service, I want you to pray for me. I feel like God's calling me to, to be a missionary. I said, well, you know, I'll be praying. God's will be done. He'll, he'll certainly, I said, get in that book. He'll give you a promise. He'll show you. He'll give you a verse. So the next morning we have service. He gets up and announces he's going in full-time evangelism. I'm thinking, whoa, what a second here. Last night he's going to be a missionary. Today you're going to be a miss, uh, an evangelist. And all of a sudden, red flag goes up in my, my, my life. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Bible says, you know, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. Hmm. So after that service, I said, I thought God was calling you to be a missionary. He said, oh, no, God changed his mind. Wrong. Uh, I said, well, if God called you in evangelism, he'll give you the meetings. I sat there for about two years and never got one meeting. Why? Because God didn't call him evangelism. I've seen folks get zealous for God. But I want to tell you something. If God's really moving, he'll stir you up and it has stirring consequences. He'll, he'll cause you to do something that's eternal. Hmm? I thought about this. When you feast with Jesus, and you get just sweet communion. Just sweet communion. He can say things to you that nobody else will. See, he knows all about you. And you all have heard me use that illustration in Revelation 3 where it says uh, in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And that word sup there deals with an intimate fellowship. Old timers, and even I'd have to Google this, old timers used to pour coffee and have it in the saucer, and then they'd pour the coffee in the saucer and one would get on one side and drink from the saucer, and the other would get on the other side and drink from the saucer. And they're just nose-to-nose -nose fellowshipping over the coffee, having sweet communion. What can I say? That's what the Lord is using in that term, sup. That's what it, that's what it means. Just sitting there supping right nose-to-nose -nose with each other. You see, that's what the Lord wants to do in our lives. He wants to, us to get so close to him that the world and everything else doesn't matter anymore where we just have sweet communion with him. You get that close to him, it doesn't matter what's going on at the job. It don't matter what's going on in the country. It don't matter what's going on in the bank account. It don't matter about anything because you're close to Jesus. And when you get to feasting with him, you can get that close to Jesus. Sweet communion. Hmm? I thought about this. Feasting with Jesus ensures serene contentment. You ever got that close to Jesus, nothing else will satisfy you. You will have serene contentment. You will say, hallelujah, I'm in a good place. I've never known anybody that got that close to Jesus and then get up and complain about how dark it was. I've never seen anybody get that close to Jesus and get up and complain about anything. Because they have sweet contentment. Contentment, God, godliness with contentment is great gain. And you'll be content. There are some people that are always looking for something new. They're looking for a new thrill. They're looking for a new hobby. They're looking for a new this or a new that. Something shiny here, something shiny there. Because their life, they're not satisfied. There's holes in their heart. But if they ever get to where they feast with Jesus, none of that stuff doesn't matter anymore. All the shiny stuff doesn't matter anymore. Because when you get to that close to the one who is the light, nothing compares to him. Hmm? Now I thought about this last When you feast with Jesus, it leaves a solid certification. 
when you've been with him and then you go out into the world, people know you've been with him. You'll talk different. You'll look different. You'll have a different attitude. You'll have a different countenance. Everything about you will be different because you've been with Jesus. You can't get that close to him and he not rub off on you. Moses got that close to him on the mountain. He come down, his face shone. They had to put a, put a, you know, a rag over his head. Hmm? I want to tell you something. You get that close to him, you'll shine too. Did not the apostles, unlearned men, and yet those that were doctors of the law took note of them, and they took note that he'd been, that they'd been with Jesus? Hmm? I say, folks, will take note that you've been with Jesus. Isn't it a blessing when you go somewhere and folks said, you all just came from church, didn't you? It's really not hard to pick us out anymore. Uh, I see some folks and they say they come from church. I thought they just come from the bar or they just come from a ball game or they just come, they don't look like they came from church. The other day I worked a funeral told Miss Annette this. I worked a funeral down at Taylor Mill Pentecostal Church. And uh, uh, we worked this funeral, and, and, and come find out, I knew the man. I didn't know him, but I, I'd met him. And uh, I told Miss Annette, I said, it was so refreshing to go and do a funeral, and people came to the funeral dressed like they were going to church. You know, they didn't look like a bunch of bums. You know, I, I see some folks come to the funeral, I'm thinking, dude, you know, at least knock the mud off your shoes. I've been to Baptist churches, and folks come in, look like bums to a funeral. Come into the church wearing a ball cap, look like bums. I mean, used to. Folks knew if you went to church, you, you dressed up. If you went to a wedding, you dressed up. If you went to a funeral out of respect for the family, you dressed up. Hmm? But see, all this watered-down Christianity is giving somebody no standards. We ought to set the standard. When we leave church, folks say, y'all church folks, aren't you? They ought to know by our dress. They ought to know by our speech. And they certainly ought to know by our countenance that we've been with Jesus. Hmm? I don't know that. Huh? Used to go to Frisch's after church on Sunday night, and everybody in there had been to church. You can tell. Huh? Nowadays, Frisch's cringes when people come from church because church people don't tip. That is terrible. Yeah. When it comes to restaurant talk, you know what they'll say about Doug Foster in eternity? He ate well, and he tipped well. Huh? People work hard. They don't make anything anyway, and then COVID's about killed them. Be good to them. But you sit there and you pray over your food, and then you give them a wrinkled up dollar for all their hard work for you. Huh? Tip them. And if you're going to leave a track, tip them good. Because the name of the church is on the back of the track. Huh? Huh? They'll turn around and say, oh, that Emmanuel crowd, they're good people. They tip good. The FedEx guy, he's been coming, he's been telling, remember Ray, you've met him. He's been telling us for months he's going to come try our church. Well, he stopped me Thursday. He kept me for a while. I know all about his life history now. <clears throat> but every time he always says, you know, I can't get my family to come. Can't get my, I told him, I said, well, why don't you try coming, and maybe they see you're getting help, they'll decide to come with you. He said, that's a good idea. And you all going to love this. Where's Phil? I'm coming to Phil for a reason. You'll understand after I say this. On his way out, he said, thank you, Father Foster. <laughs> well, I am a foster. I am a father, but not his father. Because he's as old as me. Huh? But you know what he has told me? Because he's met Ray, and he's met a couple people here doing some work around it. But you know what he told me? He said, I want to try this. There's something about this church. He said, I can tell there's good people come here. Now, how does he know that just walking in the door giving us packages? 
because this is the Lord's garden. Hmm? Huh? I told him, I said, you come on. I said, you're going to find there's a lot of good folks here. Hmm? Hopefully he comes soon. You pray for him. Pray for his family. His name is Brian. You pray for Brian. And just be good to people. You know, when you've been with Jesus, it tells on you. There is, without a doubt, a solid certification. Folks, no. I want to tell you something. Folks can pick out a, a fake. But they know when somebody's got the goods. Never fake anything. Just have the goods. You know what? When you've been around Jesus, you don't have to apologize for it. Folks just know. There's just something about feasting with Jesus. Now, can I say this? He went down into the garden. He went to the bed of spices. He gathered the lilies. He feeds the lily, or feeds there in, in the garden, and he feedeth the lilies. It's all in, initiated by him. But can I say this? If you don't want him, he's not going to show up. Seek and ye shall find. Ask and ye shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you want to feast with him, he's going to feast with you. He only shows up where he's invited. So why don't you start inviting him to feast with you more often? To commune with you. Well, how can I do that, preacher? Well, you can do it every day when you open up your Bible to read your devotion. Lord, speak to me today. You don't have to read 40 chapters for him to speak to you. Sometimes, like when I started reading, I just got to that little second verse there, and I, he was flooding my soul. You don't have, you know, if you're seeking him, you'll find him. When you pray, say, Lord, I sure would like to talk with you for a minute. You'll be amazed at how much conversation you'll have with the Lord. See, when your prayer life's about him and not stuff, you'll be amazed at how much he'll feast with you. When your Bible reading's about him and not so you can say, I read my Bible, you'll be amazed at how much you'll see him. If you come to church saying, Lord, I sure hope that everybody's there today, but I'm coming to see you. You'll enjoy that everybody's here, but there's, you won't be disappointed because you'll see him. We ought to feast with him every day, and especially when we come to his house. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you feasted with him? When was the last time somebody knew you'd been around Jesus? See, you can't feast with him if you're not right with him. You can't feast with him if you're hiding things from him. And you can't feast with him if you don't want to feast with him. But oh, if you come clean with him and ask him and seek him, you can feast with Jesus. And can I say, your day goes a whole lot better with Jesus in it than without him. When was the last time you feasted with him? When was the last time you just sat down and broke bread with Jesus? Hmm? Nothing like it, friend. He's a present help in time of trouble. He'll help you too, friend. Let's all stand. Let Ray come get a song. While they're picking out a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being able to feast with you. Thank you for the privilege of being in your garden. I thank you for being considered one of your flowers. Lord, what a blessing, Lord, to be able to bloom where you plant us. Now, Lord, I pray you'd help your folks create a desire in their heart to be satisfied with nothing less than feasting with you. Lord, feast with them every day this week. Then, Lord, when we assemble together, show out a great way. Help our church to be one of those beds of spices where you long to just hang out for a while. Now, Father, help folks touch hearts and get glory. Well, thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.